Folks, glad you're here this morning. As was mentioned earlier, probably most all of us are very aware, it's the 21st anniversary of 9-11. You know, the world came to a standstill that day on 9-11 when we got attacked. And it was interesting because the president of the country, the entire nation, there was no issues about prayer, about political correctness. Nobody cared because we were under attack. And I was talking to my wife this morning. I said, you know what's ironic? We're still under attack. We're always going to be under attack from within. That's just a fact. I don't know which guy said it. We could probably Google it up and get it. But he said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Being vigil, standing watch, being ready. Scripture tells us, be ready because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? So, Everybody in life is trying to look for the real thing. Does anybody know what the real thing is? There you go. Thank you, brother. You get that. <laughs> They've been advertising for years. Coca-Cola. It's the real thing. Uh, we live in a counterfeit world, don't we? Everybody proposes to be the, the real thing, but we find counterfeit everywhere we look. So to get your minds going this morning before we get started, I want to give you a riddle. Everybody likes a good riddle. So listen carefully. Now let me set it up for you. Harvard graduates, 90% of them missed this question. 90% of kindergartners got it right. Now it's got five clues. Wait till you hear them all and see if you can get it right. What's more powerful than God, more evil than the devil? The rich need it, the poor have it, and if you die, if you eat it, you'll die. Let me say it again slow. What's more powerful than God, more evil than the devil? The rich need it, the poor have it, and if you eat it, you'll die. Nothing. There you go. The reason kindergartners got it is they answered the first question. When you answer that one, you answer the rest of them. What's more powerful than God? Nothing. What's more evil than the devil? Nothing. What do the rich need? Nothing. What do the, rich, what do the poor have? Nothing. And if you eat nothing, you'll die. <laughs> Isn't that kind of interesting? A little brain teaser gets you going this morning. So as we start our class this morning, I want to start in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. It says, but know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, with out of control, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, says that they'll be traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to this. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn yourselves away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. It says in these last days, I, I sometimes think we're here. So, is it possible that we're drifting from the truth of God's Word? That as a society, and sometimes within the church, we drift. Isn't that a possibility? You know, there's deception everywhere we look. In Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe to those who call good evil and to those who call evil good, right? If we look in John 4, 23, 24, there's the woman at the well, and Jesus said, For the time has come and now is when the true worshipers of God will worship in spirit and in truth. We've talked about this in a couple of our classes. It's a little s. Spirit means sincerely, and truth means by the Word of God, right? And we've studied in previous classes that we're all going to be judged by one judge, right? When Jesus came in John 12, He said, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. He said, but the word that I speak to you will judge you in that day. And we have in our possession that word which He spoke to us through divine inspiration. This is what will judge us in the last day. And now the scariest verse in the Bible, one of them, there's several. Proverbs 14, 12. For there is a way which seems right to a man, but its way leads to death. That means you and I 
a person can believe with all their heart they're doing what is right and be dead wrong. What a tragedy to be standing before the Lord on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, did I not worship you and praise you and do many works and signs and wonders in your name? And to have him say, depart from me, I never knew you. That would be a tragedy, would it not? Today we're, we're, we're talking about why evangelism, and the topic for today is going to be biblical, and I use that word, biblical baptism, and is it essential for salvation? Okay? If you listen to people and you ask five different people if baptism is required for salvation, you'll probably get five different answers. So I thought we would go to God's Word this morning and look and see what God has to say on this subject through His Word about baptism and its role in the salvation, the saving of those that Jesus died to save. Does that sound like a reasonable thing to do, to let God talk to us? So that's what I'd like to do this morning. If you would, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask that you would give each one of us wisdom and discernment when it comes to reading your word, to understanding what it is you would have us to do. At the same time, we pray for compassion and love and patience with others and with ourselves, understanding that knowledge will pass away. Everything will pass away, but love endures forever. Help us to love you and to love others, to be forgiving and to be patient. But Father, help us never to compromise on what we know to be true. Your word endures forever, and it contains the words of life that we might know that we have eternal life. We pray, Father, that we will cling tightly to your word, for it is by it that we will be saved and by your word that we'll be judged. And we pray, Father, that we will lovingly guide others to your word, that they too might have the assurance of salvation, not based on any man's doctrine and not based on anyone's opinion, but on your word that never changes. We pray for your blessing on us this morning as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. So... Let's begin by looking at what the Bible says about, there we go, what the Bible says about baptism. First of all, if you look in Ephesians 1, it says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 4, it tells us there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Now, the Apostle Paul went on to explain to us in Galatians 1, and it's fascinating here what he says. He's astonished. He's baffled. He says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who called you in the grace to a different gospel, which is not another. In other words, he's saying, you're being called to another gospel, but there's no such thing. There's only one gospel. He says, but there are some who trouble you. It's highlighted in black on your screen. It says, and they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. The word pervert. Do you know what that means? So I have a ballpoint pen here. It's kind of neat. It has a little clip on it so I can put it in my pocket without it falling out. It's retractable so I don't get ink on my shirt. It's designed for writing, and it has some other benefits and features. But if I use it for a chisel and beat on it with a hammer, I'm perverting the use for which it was designed and intended. You and I were designed and intended for good works. Ephesians 2.10 For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you and I should walk in them. But when we don't use our bodies for that which God designed them for, we pervert it. We live in a counterfeit society, a society where the truth gets twisted into a lie and that which is evil gets turned into being something good. We see it every day. So the point here is the Apostle Paul's addressing the Galatians and us saying there are people who are troubling you with a message that's contrary to what we've given you. Look what he says. But even if we, talking about the Apostle Paul or the other apostles or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel to you than the one which we preach to you. Let him be accursed. Some versions say an anathema. He says, as we've said before, for emphasis, he's going to repeat himself. Let me say it again. 
If anyone preaches to you any other gospel than the one that you received, let them be accursed. It's pretty strong language, is it not? You think he's serious about that? Gospel's good news. It's the message of how we get saved. If somebody tells you there's a way to get saved that's contrary to the word of God, is that not a different gospel? Of course. We've got to be very, very careful that the gospel we follow is the one that God gave us so that we can be saved. So we're going to look at five areas of baptism today, biblical baptism. First, the meaning and method of baptism. Second, we're going to look at the purpose of a biblical baptism. We're going to look at the necessity of biblical baptism. We're going to look at the timing. When should a person be baptized? And is there an urgency about biblical baptism? And finally, we're going to look at some forms of baptism not found in the Bible, but that are very popular in our society today that we have to deal with and that you'll, work, you'll hear people talk to you about. Let's look at what Jesus said in Mark 7, 6 and 7. It's on the screen. He says, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Now he's talking to Pharisees and scribes. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Now let's pause for a moment here. Let's think about what he just said. They're honoring him with their lips. You ever have anybody give you lip service and say, oh yeah, you bet, we'll do whatever you ask, and they walk away and don't do it? That's what was going on here. Next he says, in vain do they worship me. What does vain mean? It means worthless, of no value, right? You're worshiping, but it has no value and no benefit to you. Can you imagine? Making sacrifices, living a sacrificial life, doing things for God, putting yourself out of the way, and it's for vanity, it's for vain, it's, it has no value, it's, it's all vain worship. That's what he's saying. But he goes on to say, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. If I tell you that you need to be circumcised to go to heaven, the New Testament doesn't say that, does it? I am giving you a commandment of men, not an oracle of God. So what if I tell you all you need to do to be saved is to ask Jesus into your heart, say a sinner's prayer, and you're saved. You know what I like to ask people when they give me anything that's contrary to the Word? Can you please show me the chapter and verse in the Bible where it says that? I would love to believe what you're saying, but let's make sure we're in the truth of God's Word when you say it. I just want to see it. Is that a fair request? To want to see it? Of course it is. So, we're going to look at the method and the meaning. First of all, what does it mean, the definition of baptism? It comes from a Greek word called baptizo. Baptizo means to immerse, to submerge, dip, or plunge. I like that song. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. How did he plunge you and I to victory? Baptism. <laughs> Baptizo. So there are other Greek words in the Bible, though, that are used, and we need to be aware of them. There's one called rentizo. Rentizo means to sprinkle. However, it is not used in the Bible for baptism. Another word that's in there is chio. Chio means to pour. Not used in the Bible whenever they're talking about baptism. Okay? But it's good to know that because there are some who teach pouring water on your head will suffice as a baptism. There's some that teach sprinkling on you will suffice as a baptism. We're not trying to split hairs. We're trying to be biblically accurate when it comes to God's Word, right? We pray for wisdom. We pray to know the truth. But if we don't, if we ignore it, then where are we, right? So we need to know these things. So as we look at the Bible, let's look at a few things. And just amongst ourselves, we're not going to go chapter and verse on this, but I encourage you to look it up. So when we look, and if you get a Greek lexicon, you can actually go through where the word baptism is used. John the Baptist, when he baptized others, he was in a river. It was complete submersion. When Jesus went down to the river and was baptized, how was he baptized? The same way, baptizo, immersed. How did the New Testament examples of baptism, and we're going to look at some of those, how were they baptized? Every single example in the Bible that's given to us is immersion, baptizo. So the question comes, 
What biblical method should you and I use when it comes to baptism? Immersion, right? We're just following logic and reason. The enemies of <laughs> deception. It would, uh, you know, a lot of things though, if, if you look at it, if we follow the, and I like that, what Ronnie said, it would be nice if they translated it, right? And just said, be immersed, <laughs> right? However, the people at that day and time knew exactly what it meant. And the Bible, and God is good about this, when He gives us commands, examples, and necessary inferences in the Word, so that if you just will use a little common sense and reason and observation, there's an old saying, if you see a successful person and you imitate them, you have a good opportunity, a great opportunity to be successful too. If you'll follow the example of Jesus and the apostles, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. You just follow their example and you got it. But what happens is people get a little too intellectual for their own good, self-included. Sometimes we get a little too smart for our own britches, as I've heard it said, right? We need to make sure that we're staying true to God's Word. Does God's Word always make sense to us? Of course not. When, when God told Moses, grab the people and head out in the desert, well, I don't like what we got here, but there's no food and water in the desert. That doesn't make sense. Where are we going to go? He said, just go. And God provided for them, didn't he? Manna, a pillar of fire at night so they could see. He led them. When they got to a, the, the Red Sea and they had no escape, and Pharaoh and his chariots are gaining on them, God provided. You see, I really believe that what God wants from us is trust and faith. Does that make sense? And if he gives you the ability to see everything up front, you don't have to trust Him because you're relying on what you already know. But we don't know, so we trust God. But what He has given us, and I like your comment, Ronnie, that's why study to show thyself approved is in the, in the Scriptures. Study the Word to show thyself approved, being able to rightly divine the Word of, of truth. So we look for the meanings of words. You know, that's one of the things that's hurting our society today and our children is that the meanings of words have been discarded. Marriage. We know what marriage means. We've known what marriage has meant for years. Now marriage can mean a dog, same sex. It's, 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 it's bizarre. It's crazy. It's actually woe, right? It's calling good evil and evil good. So let's look now at the purpose of biblical baptism. What does Acts 2.38 tell us? Let me read it. Repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the question, what is the purpose of baptism? For the forgiveness of sins. Now, did you say that? Did I say that? Or does God's Word say that? God's Word says that. The purpose of baptism is the, according to God's Word, is the forgiveness of sin. Hmm, okay. There's more purposes than that, but that's one of them. So Colossians 2.12, excuse me, Galatians 3.27 says, For all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Oh, so baptism is now me clothing myself with Christ. Say it. Getting into a covenant relationship with God. We're going to get into more of the covenant there too. Marriage is a covenant. Our relationship with Jesus is a covenant. Colossians 2.12 having been buried with Him in baptism. Oh, wait a minute. Now, baptism is also a burial. Do you bury people while they're still alive? You shouldn't, right? It's better to wait till they're gone. <laughs> but we're supposed to be buried with Christ. And it says, if you're buried with Christ, you'll also be raised with Him through your faith in the working of God. Now, if you're going to bury yourself, you need to first die. That doesn't mean stop breathing. It means die to living for yourself and start living for God. Okay? That's the hardest part of the conversion process. Getting wet is no problem. Confessing is not a big problem for a lot of people. Even believing intellectually that Jesus is the Christ is not that big a problem. Surrendering your will to the Lord's will is the biggest challenge we have in the conversion process. 
And you know why? We don't want to. The truth is we don't want to. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And guess what? The marketing people out there in our society know it. They market everything to what, hey, you deserve a break today. Come to Burger King where you'll be a king. Special service. Come on in. We'll give you what you want, right? Catering to people. Have it your way. That's it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is basically the gospel. The Paul, Apostle Paul says, I delivered to you what I received of first importance. He says, listen carefully, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. It says that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to scripture. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel good news, and we'll talk more about that. But the important things we have to understand, when it talks about baptism, we're told to obey the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How do you obey the death, burial, and resurrection? Well, you have to die to yourself. You have to be buried. Where does that happen in Scripture? In the waters of, say it again, baptism. baptism. Man, you guys are scholars. <laughs> in the waters of baptism, you're, you're buried. And when you arise, it says we arise newness of life. We're resurrected and we receive something at baptism. Does anybody know what it is scripturally? The Holy Spirit of God is given to you. Acts chapter 2, 37, 38. 1 Peter 3, 21 says this. There's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. It's referring to Noah. Remember Noah? Remember the ark? Noah and his, his wife and their children. Three sons, three daughters. So, And they had all the animals. And God saved them, right? He says, not the removal of filth of the flesh. Baptism is not a physical bath. He's trying to get that out in the open right now. He says, but what it is, is the answer of a good conscience toward God. God says, be baptized. Our clear, good conscience before God says, yes, sir. Where you send me, I will go. What you ask me, I will do. I am no longer mine. I am yours. I will do what you say, God. God has said, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. When we say no to baptism, who are we saying no to? Louder. God. You're not saying no to me. I'm not the one asking to be baptized. God is asking us to be baptized, but don't just do it to do it. Understand what it means. It's a death to you living for yourself. Then you're buried in baptism, and it's living for God. So let's look what it says in 1 Peter 1, 22, 23. It says, since you have purified your souls in what? Obeying the truth. Your souls are purified in obeying the truth. What is the truth? John 17, 17, thy word is truth, right? We've obeyed the truth and we purify our souls. Can we purify our souls if we don't obey the truth? A natural inference here is the answer is no, right? Sometimes we do that. We use inferences. And it goes on to say, we obey the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Oh, so God wants me to love you guys. <laughs> he wants you to love me too. It says, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again. Ooh. It wants us to be born again. So let's look at the purpose, a recap of the purposes we just looked at very quickly. Baptism gives us the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, 38. We put on, we clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 27. We obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're buried with Him in baptism because we've died to ourselves. We're now living for Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We also purify our souls through obedience. 1 Peter. We become, and you, we didn't read this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is, two words, big words, we're going to look at this some more in our lesson today. If anyone is, in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Please pay attention to those two words, in Christ. There's a test. Actually, a little quiz. We're going to look at that. It's very, very significant. In Christ and what it means. So baptism also does something biblically for us that nothing else can do. Gee, wonder what that is. It puts you and I 
in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see more about that in just a moment. So, let's talk about the necessity of baptism. What it says. Let's look in Ephesians as we talk about this in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read 1 through 13. Listen very carefully here. Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to how many times he says in Christ or in the Beloved. Blessed be God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, and to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace which He made to abound to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to the good pleasure which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, in Him. You see in this in Him, in Him, in Him? In whom we have obtained an inheritance having predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should to the praise of His glory. Man, there's a lot of in Christ. In first chapter, verse 13, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, let's look at some things here, shall we? As we looked at just then, I want you to notice the in hymns here that we're going to recap. It's on your screen, and we're just going to go through it real quick. In Christ we have, first of all, we've been chosen to be holy, set apart for a divine purpose. Number two, in Christ we have redemption through His blood. In Him we have redemption. We have in Him the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We just read that. In Him, you and I have been adopted. In Him, we have been accepted to God. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance. Right? And in Him, you received the Holy Spirit when you believed and obeyed the gospel. So, John 3, 1 through 6 the key verse here is, it says, unless one is born again of water and the Spirit, they can in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless one is born again of water, baptism, and the Spirit, that's God's blood coming, Jesus' blood coming into contact with us in the water. Did you notice that it didn't say, unless one is born again of belief, Unless one is born again of confession, unless one is born again of repentance. Does it say that in your Bible? No. Unless one is born again of water and the Spirit. That's no accident that Jesus said that. Because we have many passages that say, if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. Is that true? If we define the word belief correctly. Belief means to obey, right? If belief means you've given your life to the Lord and you'll obey Him, then yes, because you will have been baptized. You will have repented. You will have put on Christ in baptism. You will be walking in the light and shunning the darkness, right? You see what I'm saying? Mark 16, 16, and we're going to come back to this one in a minute. Jesus Himself said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe is condemned already. Ask yourself the question, is baptism essential for salvation? Now, let's look at something, the big question. All this begs a huge question. If in Christ is where all the blessings are, right? And they are. How does one get into Christ biblically? That's the question. Biblically, how do we do it? And where do we find that in Scripture? 
Acts 2 there, and, and you can think of another one. Just off the top of your head. Man, look at there. He's a smart. Romans 6, 3 through 6. That's exactly right, Ronnie. Let's listen to what God has to say about how we get into Christ Jesus. He says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, did you hear what he said? Baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too should also walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That's that person we put to death, right? That's our self-will. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Look at what it says in Colossians 2.12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up through faith, the working of God who raised him from the dead. And finally, 1 Corinthians 12.13. It says, for by one spirit, now listen to this, we were all baptized into one body. We're baptized into Christ, but we're baptized somewhere else. Into the body of Christ. You can't join the church. Did you know that? You can't be voted into the church. Oh, they can try, but that won't get you in. To get into the Lord's church, you have to go into to it His way. You can't go around and you can't go through man-made doctrines that are taught as God's law, right? You have to go God's way to get into God's kingdom. And what does it say right here in God's Word? That we were all baptized into one body. So I'm going to ask you, how do you get into the body of Christ? Baptized biblically. How do you get into Christ Jesus biblically? Baptized. I don't want to harp on it, and sometimes baptism, we can seem like we're being very narrow-minded. We're not being narrow-minded. We're trying to be biblically-minded, right? We talked at the beginning of class. We live in a world of counterfeit. We live in a world of deception. We live in a world of good intent, but we're short on fact. People with good intentions do bad things. There's an old saying, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. That is a very true statement. The pathway to hell is paved with lots of good intentions. That's why Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, good intentions, but its way leads in the way of death. You can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Correct? It's worth noting. So let's look at something here, the timing of baptism. When should a person be baptized? Biblically. Because people say, oh, well, you know, as soon as you... Know that Jesus is the Christ, get baptized. Well, let's see what the Bible says. So, let's look at a few things here. Where does faith come from? Hearing. Hearing what? God's Word. We find that in Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and that by the Word of God. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, don't we? Scripture tells us that. If you don't believe that He's the Son of God, being baptized won't help you one lick. We also need to repent of our sins out of godly sorrow. In a future class, we're going to talk about godly sorrow and about how God's Word convicts our hearts. That's why it's so important that we, have, we study God's Word because the Word of God convicts men's hearts of sin and of a need for repentance. You know, if you repent, there's no godly sorrow. Is it really repentance or is it just an outward behavior modification? We need to be careful of that. Obviously, we need to confess. Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father. That's right. And we must become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we have the Great Commission. And he says, go ye into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever of community, uh, I have taught, given you, now, commanded you. But I want to share something here. There is a natural progression that we need to pay attention to. I can't believe until I hear, correct? So I have to hear first. But then I believe. And then belief becomes conviction of my heart that there's something needs to change in me, which creates godly sorrow. 
That's, I'm not sorry for, I got caught. I'm sorry I did it, right? My sin put Jesus on the cross. When I come to that realization, then it leads me to repentance, to turn from my ways and turn to God. That repentance leads me to become a follower of Jesus, okay? And we're going to talk about that in future lessons in our evangelism class. We need to try to do better, and I do too, of making disciples, making followers of Jesus, not just getting them baptized. What then? We need to have them following Jesus, right? So we need to do better at that. Then we become obedient to the teachings of Christ and the apostles. So a quick recap here. Let's look what it says, the process, the progression. Hearing leads to believing. Believing leads to conviction, which is godly sorrow, which leads to confession. Confession, godly sorrow, and surrender. That word, that ugly word, surrender, your will to God's will. It leads to us surrendering our will to His. When we realize the truth, there's an eternal truth that you and I know. We all, the soul of man will spend eternity somewhere, correct? They both start with H. Somebody tell me the first one. Heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with mercy and grace. The second is, we say it quieter, we don't like it, it's hell. It's a place of eternal torment. It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place that we can't even, they use words to describe something so horrendous because they want us to understand you don't want to go there. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in Him can escape hell and have eternal life with God. When we come to that realization, we make a decision. And if you say, I'm not going to make a decision, that is a decision, right? You must choose. You're either for me or against me, Jesus said. Next, we see that confession leads to surrender, and surrender leads to following and obeying Jesus. Does it not? We're born again. We're baptized. Now, you'll see I've got a little note down here. You can date someone and never be legally joined to them. Marriage does that to you. Marriage is an event. It's not a process. Once you're married, you're married. You're hitched. You get in the wagon and take off. <laughs> okay? Now, whether the marriage is rewarding or not and fulfilling, that's a whole other class subject. But you're hitched. It's done. So you can go to church. You can do good deeds. You can make sacrifices. You can give lots of money when it's collection time. If you've not been born again, if you're not in Christ Jesus, I don't want to tell you this, but the book says only those in Christ Jesus are going to heaven. Those who are in the church. The body of Christ. Jesus is going to present the body of Christ to His Father one day. If you're not in that body, you're not going. It matters. Yes, sir. Is that in chapter 1? Yeah, it's down around 9 or 10. 9, yeah. The I, I, only reason I know it is because of 7 and 8. It says Jesus is coming again with flaming fire seeking vengeance on two classes of people. This isn't the loving, kind Jesus we see sometimes, right? He's coming back with flaming fire, and He's seeking vengeance on two classes of people. Those that don't know God, and it says, and those who refuse to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if you don't do it, it's refusal, it's rebellion. He's made it the offer, but we have to accept it, right? Or reject it. Good point. And man, the description of what he says. It's, it's, read it again, Ronnie. Yep. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. Now, who says that? God, through His Word. That's why it is so important that we share this good news gospel with people, isn't it? Because heaven and hell are in the balance. Now, there's a lot of issues in life, and we understand that. But we need to make sure that we're loving people the way God loves us and sharing. So let's take a moment, and we're going to look at some... How did I... Did I jump ahead or behind, or what did I do here? There's no telling what I did. Yes, ma'am. Please do.
Here we go. Hebrews 6. Second Peter. Oh, so it says the same thing twice. <laughs> it must be for emphasis. Okay. Yes. Right. So for those who couldn't hear, I appreciate that very much. So in 2 Peter, it tells us it would be, it's worse off for those who have once been saved and then fall away, right, than to have never known the Lord. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 6 reinforces that and says, look, how can we neglect so great a salvation? God has paid the price. Died on the, Jesus died on the cross for us. If we accept that salvation and then treat it like it's nothing, and do nothing with it, he says it would be better that you never knew Jesus than to know him and then turn your back and live like the world again. How could we do such a thing? I'm going to tell you how. It's not because we're, we're, we're idiots, although that might be an idiotic thing to do. It's because of deception. We are easily deceived into believing that we're okay. There's a way that seems right to a man but its way leads to the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Again, it's a scary verse. You can think you're right and not be. So let us look at the urgency of biblical baptism. So, is it urgent? And if it is, why is it urgent? So first of all, what happens to one who dies and is not born again? If they don't receive forgiveness of sin. I know it. But Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, right? So we don't have to go there. We know what the answer is. One of the rhetorical. We don't have to keep answering it. So let's look at some biblical examples for a moment. Acts chapter 8. Philippian on over to Acts chapter 8. And you're probably very familiar, but I just want to share a few quick stories with you right out of Scripture. When I say stories, these are accounts of conversions. The Ethiopian treasure it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch a, uh, of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasury, had come there to worship, to Jerusalem. And he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And Philip came up to sit with him. The place in the scripture they were reading was, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shears, he opened not his mouth. <coughs> Excuse me. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip, and he said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet speak of this, of himself or another man? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. <coughs> That's the key right there, folks. No matter where somebody's at in the Bible, if they have not been born again, we preach Jesus to them. We may not get another chance. People need to understand why Jesus came to earth, lived, died, and rose again. It's to take away our sins so that we can have eternal life. The Apostle Paul said it this way, I chose to know nothing among them except Christ and Him crucified. Right? That's the important part. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, now it appears he may have been Hispanic. And you might say, well, why do you say that? Well, look what he says. See, here is water. Okay, I got a few smiles. It's a little humor. Y'all are fishing to get sleepy on me. 
He said, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stop. Both he and Philip, the eunuch, went into the water. He baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. What we learn from that is, as soon as he learned that he was lost, as soon as he learned that his sin had separated from him from God, and that if he died, he would go to hell, as soon as he realized that, that only those who are born again, who are in Christ, can be saved, he said, there's water right there. What hinders me? I, life is short. The chariot might wreck. I might have a heart attack. We might get attacked by enemy. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. There was a sense of urgency about that conversion, wasn't there? So we look at Acts 16 very quickly. Verse 23. The Philippian jailer. Paul's in jail. There's an earthquake. The, the, it rattles. The guard wakes up. He sees that the, the gates are open. He assumes the prisoners have escaped. If you don't know much about Rome, if you were in charge as a guard and you let them escape, they killed you. It was usually a very torturous death. They were punishing you. They didn't want people escaping from their jails. He pulls out his sword. He's about to kill himself. He would rather kill himself than go through what Jesus did with that scourging. All things considered, I might too. Paul said, stop, stop. Do yourself no harm. We're all here. Not just Paul and the, and the apostles, but uh, uh, Silas. But so was a lot of other people. None of the prisoners escaped. The man comes to Jesus, to Jesus, to Paul. I'll get it right. <laughs> And he says, what do I need to do to be saved? Hmm. He knew something, didn't he? But do you know what Paul and Silas were doing prior to the earthquake? Anybody know? Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. They were singing and praising God at midnight. They were in prison. They, had it, they understood, didn't they? They understood they were on a mission from God and they belonged to God and God was going to do great things in their lives. And here he is right here in this situation doing great things. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In verse 30, verse 31, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your household. Now stop. A lot of people teach a partial doctrine here. A partial doctrine, not the whole doctrine. Some people say, well, it says right here, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And I do. It doesn't say nothing about baptism. Turn the page or go to the next verse. It says, <clears throat> then they spoke what? The word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Now, we're going to use a little what's called necessary inference. This guy's not a Bible scholar. He's a Roman guard. He doesn't know about being born again in the scriptures. But it says right here, they spoke to him the word of the Lord. Apparently, obviously, they spoke to him about being born again. Why do we say that? Verse 33, it says, He took him the same hour of the night, <clears throat> washed their stripes. They had been beaten. He says, immediately, it says, And he took them and washed their stripes. Immediately, he and all of his family were what? Baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and they rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? Look what it says. Having believed in God. When did they believe in God? When they were baptized. The belief was consummated and fulfilled. Does the devil believe and shudder? The book of James says he does. But he doesn't obey, does he? So his belief is not accounted to him as righteousness. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. Good point. Yes. Correct. Excellent. And so true. <clears throat> so we're going to go through some examples real quickly of some unbiblical teaching that we see. First, we'll hear postponing or delaying baptism to allow for a public showing is okay. However, that's not found in the Bible or it's not taught and there's no example of it. So you decide for yourself if it's okay to postpone your baptism, knowing that life is uncertain. 
you may die between now and next, uh, Tuesday of next month when they've decided for you to be baptized. So you have to figure that out yourself. We just go by the, what the scriptures say. Some people teach that baptism is an outward expression of an inward grace, meaning that baptism is just declaring that your sins have been forgiven already, that you've already received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that you've been added to the church. There's only one problem with that. First of all, it's not biblical. Second of all, there's no examples. And third, it actually contradicts what the Word of God says. Now it's not only different, it's in contradiction. So we got to be careful. That's a false gospel right there. So be careful with that one. What about infant baptism? There's three reasons or beliefs for non-biblical infant baptism. First, it's taught that it cleanses the child of original sin. However, we read in Ezekiel 18.20 that... Give me just a second. We're almost done. The soul that sins shall die, but the son shall not suffer for the, sin, the iniquity of the father, and nor shall the father for the, sons of the, for the sins of the son. Every man, it says, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. What we're saying is, <clears throat> you're accountable for your sin, not somebody else's. There is no original sin. Infant baptism, and that is for an infant, Infant baptism puts a child into the church and therefore gives, makes them saved. Well, that's not biblical. If you're baptized into the church and it's a submersion that comes after belief, hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing, the baby can hear, but he can't believe. He can't repent. He can't confess, right? So that doesn't fit. And finally, it's, it's thought that it introduces the child into the church and the other sacraments in the church. The infant is going to go wherever it's brought with no choice whatsoever of its own will, and it knows nothing. So, that said, infant baptism is not based on any biblical teaching. There's no place in the Old or New Testament where such a practice is seen, taught, or commanded. Now, I'm not going to say anything bad or disparage if someone does it. However, it's not biblical, okay? It's not going to gain the baby anything. The baby is going to have to stand accountable once it become, reaches the age where it can be. It stands on its own two feet, just like you and I do, right? There's no scene, conversion scenes of infants in the Bible. <clears throat> so we're going to, this is Ezekiel 18.20. I just put it up there for you. So let's look at and summarize real quick. Is baptism essential for salvation? Well, Instead of answering it, let's ask the question, what did Jesus say? That's a lot better than us answering it. And that's a good thing for people when we take them to... Let's go to God's Word and see what Jesus says in Mark 16, 16. He says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe is condemned. So if you're going to ask, is it essential? What does Scripture say? In conclusion, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The purpose of baptism, according to the Bible, it's the place where we enter into Christ. It's where we obtain forgiveness. It's where we receive the Holy Spirit. It's where we become a new creation. And it's where we are added to the Lord's body. That's what happens at baptism, according to Scripture. Therefore, according to the Bible, baptism is essential for salvation. Now, I've seen people harp way too much on baptism and we forget about surrendering our lives to the Lord, right? Without surrender, the baptism does no good. So we need to make sure we understand that. There needs to be this godly sorrow and a surrender to the Lord. Can we stop surrendering and get off track and live for ourselves occasionally? Of course, there's plenty of scriptures that talk about that. Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't crawl off the altar. Continue to live a sacrificial life for God. But by all means, never let anybody tell you, because biblically, baptism is essential for salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we started this morning, we want to finish. Please give us a heart of compassion and patience with others, but help us have a resolve that we will cling tightly to your word, knowing that salvation is therein. Help us never to compromise with the truth of your word, and help us, Father, to show others we pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our sins and help us never to become self-righteous because we know maybe more than someone else. It's not the knowledge that saves us. It's Jesus. It's our submission and surrender to Him. And, Father, only those who have been circumcised to the heart, who have had Jesus' blood 
cleanse them, can go to heaven. And we know this from your word. So we pray, Father, that all will come to repentance and they will be born again of water and the Spirit, that they too might have eternal life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.